Welcome, folks. This is the Mad Painter, uh, a.k.a. Thomas Becker, and we're having a little bit of trouble connecting with our guest tonight, so uh, give us a few more minutes. Uh, we're in the process of uh, trying to get his uh, his other cell number worked up here. I'm going to give it a, give his uh, house number another try, uh, and let me see if we can get him again. Really not sure. He's had a pretty exciting day today. I'll tell you who my guest is going to be. It's supposed to be Jim Mars, and he's wrote a, a bunch of books, and uh, hopefully uh, we can get a hold of him. Hello? Uh, howdy. Is this Mr. Mars? It is. How are you doing this evening? This is Thomas Becker from uh, Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. Yeah, Freedom Slips, yeah. How are you doing tonight? Oh, tolerable. Tolerable? Yep. Let, let me read a little uh, uh, bio I have for you that I prepared. Uh, it's not much. Uh, I just want to let our get, uh, our listeners know who, who you are. Okay. Uh, uh, I'll let me be swapping phones here. Uh, our our guest tonight has a bachelor's degree in journalism from the University of Northern Texas. He has worked for several Texas newspapers, including the Fort Worth Star Telegraph. Telegram. Yeah. He has served with, with the Fourth Army Intelligence Unit during Vietnam. In 1989, he became a prominent figure in the KFC conspiracy press, and his book Crossfire that that became a New York best-selling book, was a source of Oliver Stone's film JFK. He has appeared in many television radio programs over the years, and he has become one of the foremost researchers in the truther movement. It's my pleasure to welcome Jim Mars to the show. I'll tell you what, I was told just a few minutes ago you have finished an update on that book. Yes, I have. I I just got it off. It just to, to the just, publisher, yeah. There, and I know they're wanting to get it out before the uh, 50th anniversary, which means it'll probably be out and available by uh, end of September, October, maybe. That that's great. I I'll tell you what, it is a uh, one of the best conspiracies of the JFK. Or one of the best books of the conspiracy of JFK I've ever read, and the movie was outstanding. Uh, yeah, I was pretty flabbergasted that he was able to get that much into one movie. It, it was something else. I, I'm a little nervous. You're, you're one of my heroes, so. <laughs> yeah, well, don't be nervous. We're all doing our thing. Uh, you, you just. Uh, was uh, on Richard Dolan's show a couple weeks back, weren't you? Yeah, I've been on Dolan's show, and I was uh, I was down. I, been, I just got back from Austin, and I was down there hanging out with uh, Alex Jones for a little bit. Well, I've never met Mr. Jones. I uh, interviewed Dolan a uh, week before last. Yeah, he's a, he's a good guy. Uh, he's a very intelligent man. That guy is. Oh yeah, yeah. very uh, much so. So, uh, have, you've, you haven't gotten any slack from writing this uh, book about JFK? Um, uh, well, I'm probably too stupid to understand. <laughs> to know when I was in danger or anything. But, uh, no, I'll tell you, the whole thing is is uh, that, uh, you know, I can't go in. I'm not, I'm not that big. A, I'm a thorn in their side, but I'm not a danger because I can't go into court and swear I saw this, I heard this, I have first-hand knowledge of this. I'm just an old reporter, and I'm telling you what other people have found out. Now, if you know, if you found out something that, uh, and, and you're the only one that knows it, then I would say be very careful and <laughs> watch your watch your backside. Uh, this this is true with uh, reporting. Yeah. Uh, you. When you. Uh, when you started out, you just you you were a reporter. And uh, what got you into the conspiracy 
stuff? Uh, well, uh, when I signed up to be a reporter, that was just kind of an offshoot of my natural self, which is I'm just curious. I don't know what's going on. Uh, I don't, I, you know, I'm not a revolutionary, or I don't necessarily want to try to change everything. I just want to know what's going on. And so, when uh, in the university, and that was North Texas, you know, uh, University of North Texas, uh, when I majored in journalism, um, but this is back in the days of the old republic, and they actually taught us to, hey, you know, look behind the uh, press handouts and the uh, official pronouncements and the headlines and and uh, the press releases from the corporations and, and find out what's really going on and, and what's the truth and as best you can find it and, and tell that to your readers. And, hey, fool that I was, I, I thought that's what I was supposed to be doing. <laughs> I still do. <laughs> Come think of it. So I'm just telling people what I find out, and uh, and I keep following the evidence. And uh, that's uh, I just got a new book out. It just now it's it, it came out in mid February, um, called Our Occulted History, uh, and uh, that one is raising some eyebrows. But I guess people are beginning to wake up a little bit. I th- I thought I'd kept some real flack on that one, and actually everybody's been pretty supportive. In fact. I even got a pretty decent write-up in the New York Times, which really kind of surprised me. Now, now that one I haven't had a chance to check out. Uh, could you tell us about it? Yeah, it's uh, it's kind of a follow-on to uh, my book, uh, Rule by Secrecy, and uh, uh, the Trillion Dollar Conspiracy, uh, and the Rise of the Fourth Reich, uh, which was bringing... Uh, bringing out all the information and who's behind what I guess is commonly uh, known as the New World Order. And what I've done here is to connect uh, the topic of the New World Order to another topic that's gaining popularity but that most people never thought had any connection, and that is uh, this uh, thing that was made pretty popular by this TV series about uh, ancient astronauts, ancient aliens in Earth's past. And I'm thinking, well, if that was the case, and if there were extraterrestrials on the Earth way back in prior to our written histories, uh, surely there'd be some evidence of it, and there is a ton of it. Every primitive culture in the world talks about these gods that came from the sky and flew around and gave them knowledge and taught them all kinds of stuff, including uh, something I'll be eternally grateful for, which was, according to the ancient uh, cuneiform tablets of the Sumerians, um, it was these uh, folks that came to the earth called the Anunnaki who taught them how to make beer. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Can't be all bad, right? <laughs> I like that now. And, and so I and so sure. I'm thinking I'm thinking, well, I wonder if there's any connection between these legends and stories and, and the idea that there were uh, these ancient astronauts on the on the earth. Uh, and uh, this obvious move uh, on the part of some little clique of people that are trying to run the world and yes there are they they do connect that I, I i'm a firm believer in a lot of the ancient astronauts i've talked to quite a few of the people who have been on the show ancient astronauts mm-hmm. and uh, I, I i i believe that uh, Personally, that the what we call the Anunnaki might even have been remnants from a civilization before what we call civilization. Oh yeah, I, I'm pretty sure that's. Exa- I, I totally agree with that. Uh, you know, all it's done it's it's uh, it's only come down to us through artifacts and and ruins and all kinds of bits and pieces here there and this is what's given rise to the uh, legends of like Atlantis or Mew. Uh, and personally, uh, in my research, I kind of came to the strong suspicion that uh, that everybody, when they try to talk about where was Atlantis located, and of course some people say it's the middle of the Atlantic, and some people say it was actually Antarctica before a pole shifted, and, 
and or other people say it's in Bimini and the Caribbean, and one school of thought even has it in the South China Sea. And I think they were all right. <laughs> I think it was a <laughs> work, I think it was a worldwide, uh, pretty advanced civilization that fell into rack and ruin. And we're just now finding bits and pieces of it. And uh, uh, you remember the old story about the blind men and the elephant? Oh, I do. <laughs> I think it's well, a good an- is, analog to this, too. Yeah, just in case some of them out there yeah. uh, don't know about that, it's just an old story about the the blind men that uh, learned about the elephant, and they were really wanting to know what the elephant was. So they were taken to the zoo, and they all went up and was examining the elephant, and one got hold of his uh, big, thick, round leg, and he said, oh, the elephant's like a column. And the other one had his, was pushing his hands up against the elephant's side, and he said, no, the ele- elephant's like a wall. And the other one had his tail, and he said, no, the elephant's like a rope. And the other one had his trunk, and said, no, 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 it's like a big tube. And another one had his ear and said, no, is, is he's like, the elephant's like a big fan. And anyway, they all had a piece of it, and yet they fell out to arguing and got to fighting with each other over what the elephant looked like, see, even though they all, because they all had a, just a piece of it. And I think that's the same thing we're seeing here. Everybody argues about um, these uh, things from the past, and I think they all have a bit of the truth, which was probably a worldwide advanced civilization. And personally, I think they were... One of the things that connected them all was their power source. I think they were drawing uh, energy from the earth, uh, and and uh, by the use of pyramids. We all know about pyramid power. Or, you know, you may remember that where you put a razor blade in the, under a pyramid, it stays sharp and it does stuff. You know, and uh, there is some evidence that you can. Uh, draw energy out of the earth, and I think they were drawing our, uh, this energy out of the earth uh, with these pyramidal structures, oh, and that's... using that, using these pyramids to transmit energy all around the world. This is why a lot of people don't realize it, but there are pyramids not only in Egypt, but Central America and South America, China, Eastern Europe. You find them all over, the, uh, even uh, even in the Mississippi Valley, these ancient uh, earth mounds that are kind of pyramidal in shape. I think uh, I think they're the remnants of what was left of their energy system. Uh, that that's a good good idea there. I I, I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, you know, there's ways of making power just from the earth with you know several different kinds of metal and different. You know distances and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know what yeah and and, and uh, also configurations different uh, uh, geo uh, geometrical right forms um, I know in the in my book uh, our Occultic history I talk about uh, my friend Michael Tellinger who's a researcher in South Africa and he and some scientists have been working over there and they have found circular ruins over in South Africa that are so extensive that they give indication of maybe housing more than a million people and have been dated back 200,000 years, which is, you know, of course, far older than anything we've been taught. But what really gets me is is that they were able to scientifically test and find that within these circles, um, uh, it the uh, going down 600 feet, they find the mean temperature uh, is 42 degrees Fahrenheit outside of these circles, but inside the circles it goes up to 136 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, now that I didn't know. Yeah, it's like um, it's like a big cyclotron, or maybe not a cyclotron. Cyclotron, but uh, um, what am I trying to think of here? Uh, you know, one an oscillator, right? And uh, they're able to uh, pick up the uh, Earth's energy and uh, and channel it uh, through the use of just these geometric uh, stone structures. 
Uh, Isn't that that an amazing thing? Yeah, it is. Now, I have produced a show with Michael Tellinger before, but I've never had a chance to talk to him yet. I'd love to get him on the show. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, he's into a lot of stuff, and some of this is is pretty new. Um, Actually, these circles look nothing less than uh, what you would find uh, a diagram uh, of a uh, resonant cavity magnetron, and those things are used to generate juice. And uh, the idea is, this is what these ancients were doing. That, that sounds real interesting. I, like I said, I believe we we're far older than what they they led us to believe. You know? Oh, absolutely, and we're finding this out all the time. Well, hey, another thing I found out that I thought was pretty interesting was, uh, you know, I. There's always been a long controversy over how, how they build a great pyramid. You know, the idea that uh, the slaves of the Egyptians dragged these gigantic limestone blocks weighing hundreds of tons through the desert and somehow piled them all up into this incredible structure is just, you know, it's like, what? Uh, for one thing, having grown up in the Baptist church, and, you know, I. Sunday school, I really studied that Bible, and and uh, who were the slaves of the Egyptians? Why? The Hebrews. And who is one of the most well-documented uh, uh, groups of people in the world? The Hebrews. And yet nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in their writings, nowhere in their oral traditions do, does it ever say, oh yeah, by the way, Uncle Herbie dragged rocks through the desert all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know? it's, just, it's just not there. It's not there. Uh, and and now, uh, in recent years, they found that um, the Great Pyramid and the Sphinx also uh, both show, and I know this to be true because in 2009 I visited in Egypt and I made a point to checking this out. They both have very obvious uh, vertical uh, water erosion uh, on the uh, Great Pyramid and the Sphinx, which means that they have set out under heavy rains. Okay, so and yet, so and yet, so the uh, uh, geologists will tell you there has not been any heavy rains on the Giza Plateau for more than ten thousand years. Right. Well, yeah. now, that, you've seen it on I mean, the pyramid itself. Yeah. Well, around it and on it. Well, okay. Now, so it I was talk- there. Now I I've interviewed uh, Dr. Robert Shock. He was yes, he, yes, he's he, one of those that studied that. Well, he didn't say on the pyramid. He he wonder he refrained from mentioning the pyramids at all. That we talked about the Sphinx at the time. Well, you can get uh, you can get into the pyramid. Uh, most of the other smaller pyramids, most of which are deteriorating and kind of falling over. Right. So they they weren't built with the same skill and techniques is the Great Pyramid, but on the Great Pyramid you can still see evidence of water erosion. Wow. It, it is it is more plain around the Sphinx because of the uh, land or, that it, uh, around it in which it sits. Um, but then in 2006, Dr. Michael Barson of Drexel University and some of his colleagues uh, they have announced that uh, that the Great Pyramid is not made out of limestone blocks anyway. It's made out of a poured geopolymer uh, concrete, kind of a man-made type thing. Now, that's and, interesting. Yes, isn't that interesting? Because, see, now, instead of dragging those huge multi-ton blocks through the desert and then trying to lift them and place them up there, now all you've got is you go up there and you build a form, so you pour it in. Right. And uh, that also explains why they are so perfectly aligned uh, and situated that uh, you really can't, on on most of it, you can't put a piece of paper in between them, you know. One, one of my friends in the chat named uh, Weisenberg said he built. they built them from the top down. Uh, that's possible, <laughs> man. <laughs> That's possible, but but uh, you see what I'm saying about pouring. Uh, you know, you can uh, you can build a, a form and and then just pour them, and then you just tear down the form, and there you go. You think many of the monolithic structures around the world could have been done that way? 
That's a good question. I don't know. I'm just the reporter, but I, right. I, I, w- I would hope Dr. Uh, Barsom would uh, travel around and, and, and test out some of these others. I'm particularly interested in the, uh, in the uh, pyramids in China because they tried to de- deny that those even existed. They were photographed uh, in world, during World War II by some of the pilots that would fly over. Right. Yeah, I've uh, seen some pictures of them. They're pretty awesome. Pretty awesome. And now what I would really like to know is this uh, pyramid in Bosnia, because I have met with Dr. Sam Osmanovic, uh, who uh, is promoting that thing, and he showed me photographs of tunnels and uh, little enclaves, rooms, if you will, uh, inside what he said is this great pyramid um, in uh, Bosnia. And uh, he says that it's bigger than the Great Pyramid in Egypt, it, and that it's just huge. It's uh, northwest of uh, the city of Sarajevo. Yeah, I, and, I, I have actually emailed and talked with him a few times, and uh, we, we've discussed them, and, and they, are, they are awesome. But the, the fact that some of the tunnels were used during, during the wartime, too. So, Right. And well, and that's the thing that gets me is because you can go to uh, Google, for example, or one of the search mm-hmm. engines, or oh, Wikipedia. Go to Wikipedia, and put in their Bosnian pyramid. And you're going to get a whole page of people who, and including some experts, who say, "Oh no, no, it's just a hill." Right. And yet, when you look at it, it's definitely uh, pyramidal in shape, uh, very straight lines. But the main thing is, how do you get tunnels and and a, and a room system inside of that hill. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but, you know, I'm just saying what I've heard. You've heard yeah, the same yeah. thing. I just, what I want to know is how come somebody just doesn't go over there with a the camera crew and say, here, you know, if if they go over there and they, and they can't get in or they find a few little, you know, caves that have been cleared around a little bit and say, well, no, this is just a hill. Okay, I can accept that, but but I just want to know that's not exactly the information I'm getting. And I also understand that people, uh, and this is another thing you're going to find out from my new book, Our Culture and History, um, the the way that uh, they suppress and sequester new information like this. Right. Um, uh, it, there have been stories after stories that I've covered, and some going back into the 1800s, where they have found the bones of giant people, you know. And when I say giant, I don't mean six, seven, eight foot tall. I'm talking 12, 15 foot tall, huge giants, and they find their bones. And well, wait a minute, what happened to that? Well, <laughs> the Smithsonian Institution grabs them all up, and then they just tend to disappear. It reminds me of the scene in Indiana Jones where they have the Ark of the Covenant and they just drive it back into a government warehouse, you know, and put it in a box and stick it back in there. Um, because a lot of people think of the Smithsonian Institution as this great scientific uh, institution, which which it is. But what they don't realize is, is that ever since the 1800s, it's been an agency of the United States government. Now, has the government told us the truth about most anything? <laughs> no. I mean, you know, uh, we've, we, we, they haven't told us the truth about UFOs. They haven't told us the truth about weapons of mass destruction. They haven't told, you know, so you just, I don't know. I wish somebody that I could trust would go over there and tell me whether it's a uh, just a hill that's funny sh- shaped, or if it's a truly uh, another large pyramid. Do, do you know the late Philip Copeland? Copeland? I know who you're talking about. I, I've spoke to him about it. He's been there uh, a couple of times, uh, and uh, he believes they're real. And and I wouldn't doubt it. I mean, from the, the evidence that I've seen and my talk with, with the doctor there that's running it, I can't pronounce his name. My yeah, old southern we call him Dr. Sam. My my old southern lips just won't do it. <laughs> I know I got a problem there too. <laughs> and uh, from just from the talk with him and the information I found myself, I believe that there there's a big possibility that they're real. 
Yeah. And uh, yeah, I tend to think so too. Mainly, again, if it was the only one, you know, then I'd have real doubts. But I mean, you know, I've been to Cheese and Eatson, and uh, there's uh, uh, pyramids in in uh, Greeks in Greece, China. Uh, Central South America, so, you know, Mississippi Valley, so what's the problem of one in Bosnia? Except that would point in the direction that we have a hidden history. Well, why Which, do you think they'd hide that on us? Because they don't want us to know who we truly are or where we truly came from. Uh, because if we learn the truth of all that, and if in, there were these ancient astronauts, which means these aliens, space aliens, came to the Earth a millennia ago. Um, well, I think it's this simple. I don't think they care so much that we would know that there's uh, people in the universe uh, other than ourselves. Uh, this is something I think most believe, people believe anyway. But So they don't really care if we know there's aliens out there. The problem is if we know beyond any doubt for a certainty that there's uh, non-humans out and visiting this planet, then we're going to know for certain that there's alternative technology and it might upset their monopolies over energy and uh, medicine, communication, transportation. I mean, why would we keep paying uh, ever-increasing prices for gasoline uh, and petroleum products uh, if we found out that we don't need to be using petroleum. Wow. That's a good point. I, I believe that, that that you're right on track with that. Uh, I just wanted to hear your opinion of it. And be, uh, Yeah, well, I, I, I know for a fact. Yeah. I, I may not be able to prove it to everyone's satisfaction, but there's no doubt in my mind I've, I've been at it too long. I've been a I've been a reporter and newsman for approximately 50 years now, and uh, I know for certain that there are other ways of doing things. I can remember stories that came down the pike, like the kid up in the northwest who developed a carburetor for his car. It run 100 miles on one gallon of gasoline, and he took the media, called the media in, took them, drove them around, showed them the thing. You know, it worked, and then, oops don't hear anything about that anymore you know and and that's gone on all through history uh rudolph diesel the guy that uh, invented the diesel engine uh, he originally was trying to invent an engine run on organic matter you know like right, vegetables oil. vegetation yeah, it was uh, like that. Oil, i believe yeah yeah and uh, what happened to him oh he fell overboard crossing the english channel sorry and then the next thing you know they're not using organic matter in diesel engines. They're using compressed gasoline, <laughs> you know, gas made from gasoline and petroleum, and we're right back where we started from. Right. Hmm. I, I find that interesting. Uh, I got Now, you know that uh, when the cars first come around, you, you were talking about the diesel. This is what brought this thought to mind. We had prohibition going. That's right. Do you believe it was had to do with them wanting to, you to use refined gasoline and yeah, stuff? They, yeah, they yeah they wanted to put a stop to ethanol. <laughs> <laughs> you yeah, know, it, I believe that too. And and here's the, I just got to say this about prohibition. Uh, you know that there, there were anti uh, alcohol societies operating probably since the early 1800s and, and they gained profits in the late 1800s and then they really were, were making a push there in the early uh, 20th century uh, and I got it you know if you think about it if there ever was a uh, substance that can be proven to be hazardous it's probably alcohol I mean it's broken up so many families and caused so many car crashes and and uh, knife fights and gun fights and everything else. So, you know, you certainly can build a case that alcohol is not a very good thing. So they decided, with all and with all the young guys off over in Europe fighting World War One, they were able to slip through Prohibition uh, in 1917, 18, and they passed the Volstead Act, which was the law making it illegal to manufacture or possess 
alcohol. Uh, and then, but it only took them about 12 years to figure out that the cure was worse than the cause. Uh, number one, uh, the, the graft and the corruption and the money that was, that, that took place was incredible. The day before the Volstead Act went into effect, a little pint of whiskey cost like 50 cents. And the next day, it was like $6, okay? <laughs> it shows you the incredible amount of money. And, of course, it gave rise to organized crime, the bootleggers, the Chicago mob, Al Capone, all of that, plus the corruption that took place in government because, you know. Uh, and it, so it only took our great-grandmothers and grandfathers just about a dozen years to figure out that alcohol prohibition was not working and the cure was worse than the cause, and they repealed not only the Volstead Act, but a constitutional amendment, okay? Right. We've been under drug prohibition for, what, 30, 40 years now, and we still <laughs> hadn't figured out that punishing people and building more prisons is not the answer. <laughs> I hear that. We're, we're going to take us a break real quick and give you a chance to... to get a cup of coffee or a beer and uh, I need to get me a cup of coffee so folks we'll, we'll be back in, a, in about four minutes uh, if I get it to work <laughs> find that right button welcome back folks I love that uh, back to your host uh, music that just it's reminds me of Paul Revere spreading the word <laughs> Are you, are you back with us there, uh, Mr. Mars? Oh, yeah. I'm hanging Good. here with everybody. Just just before we uh, went to break, you were saying you think it's a shame that they uh, are still prohibition, uh, have a prohibition against drugs. You think the war on drugs is really a big scam? Oh, total scam. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it, it's really pretty incredible. Um uh, not that I'm, uh, you know, drugs can mess you up. There's no question. About oh that. yeah, there's no doubt about that. Yeah, there's no question about that. But but it's it's kind of like this stupid gun thing. The problem's not guns. It's people that abuse them. Same thing with drugs. Drugs aren't the problem. It's the people that abuse them. Um, you know, at one point back in the say about 1919, 1920, you can go down to the drugstore buy buy some heroin, buy some laudanum. You know. You get all kinds of stuff, and they had a few people that were strung out, but they didn't have the problem we have today. And the main thing is, is that nobody was being put in jail to speak of unless they actually committed a crime against somebody. Okay, attack somebody, kill somebody, rape somebody. Uh, in fact, the name escapes me at the moment, but I remember reading about this doctor uh, who uh, lived between the late 1800s and the mid 1900s and uh, was known as the father of modern surgery because he was so good he was such a great doctor that he perfected a lot of the surgical techniques that are still being used today uh he was a heroin addict and and had been in, and since he's about 20 years old and he lived to, to be in his 70s and was quite honored okay uh, he had a drug problem Okay, but but he wasn't classified as a criminal. He wasn't thrown in jail, and as a result, he ended up uh, actually benefiting and contributing to uh, society. And I think there's a lot of them there. Look at look at the people today who, because they got busted with some pot when they were 16, um, now they got a felony. Some of them have even served time. Uh, they can't get a decent job. I mean, we've wrecked whole generations of people because of our stupid. Uh, short-sighted drug laws. I'll tell you what, me and you have got a lot of the same thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you follow the evidence, it just leads you to the truth. <laughs> yes, sir, it does. And, and we here we we only uh, try to bring out the truth and uh, to people and let them make up their own mind about stuff. And right. Well, the truth is, is sometimes <laughs> uncomfortable. Sometimes it right. flies in the face of what we've been taught, and sometimes even flies in the face of what seems to make uh, good common sense. Uh, and yet, the the truth's the truth. You know, I mean, there it is. Um, some truths are 
uh, I tell you what I have found in my own life is uh, every time I try to tell a lie, you end up having to tell another lie to cover up for that one. And then you got to tell another one to cover up for those two. And pretty soon you got a whole house of cards. And, and you forget what the first lie was. Yeah, in the first you forget place. the first one. And, and, pretty, and then something, one of them breaks and the whole thing falls down. And so I found out a long time ago <laughs> the best thing to do is just tell the truth. Uh, you know. Uh, <laughs> and you're right. Sometimes it doesn't feel good to do it either. No, it doesn't, you know, and and you can get in a lot of trouble. I mean, if your wife comes home and says, hey, what do you think of my new dress? And you say, well, that's the ugliest thing I ever saw. <laughs> you might be telling the truth, but you're going to be in trouble, right? I, I do that when she cooks me something. My son, there you, you know, go. There you how go, can you tell her you don't like it? And I said, I don't want to spend the next 35 years lying to her, telling her I like it. <laughs> well, and if you tell her you like it, what's going to happen? She's going to make it more. It'll make it more, make yeah. It more, you know. <laughs> No, you just have to go, well, you know, uh, that was certainly unusual, and uh, boy, you're an innovative cook. <laughs> there you go, see? You, you haven't really lied, and you, but yet you haven't really hurt anybody's feelings either. <laughs> oh, I like that. Uh, I was asked, uh, I had people email me a couple of questions uh, to ask you, so I, in case, just you know, see what they'd come up with. And no, I was that's asked, great. I, I, I would like to be answering people anyway because uh, that's better than me sitting here flapping my lip and oh, you're about doing something great. that they don't know about or don't care about. I'd rather hear what people want to know, and if I can share they're, information with them, I will. They're, they're eating it up in the chat room right now. Uh, the question was, what do you think of uh, about Obama visiting Israel on the spring equinox? Well... If you want to, if you want to hear me rant for the next two hours or so, you should have stopped at what I, about Obama. We, we we won't stop recording. <laughs> no, uh, what I want to know is, you know, I see my my hero is still Thomas Jefferson, and yeah, he's like everybody else. He he was he had his flaws, and he he wasn't some perfect guy, but he was such a thinker. And he, and he cared about all the other people, you know. This country began to split uh, between, uh, between the followers of ha Alexander Hamilton, who was a rich guy and wanted all of the power in this country to be in the hands of rich people and, you know, the heck with the poor people. And Jefferson, he was a rich guy, too, but he really... Uh, thought about what was good for everybody and he said be friends with all the other nations but make no entangling uh, encumbrances with any of them and that was really really good advice and I've been to Israel I have a high regard for Israel I have a even higher regard for the people in Israel but but you have to understand you know, you have to separate the people from the policies. Uh, same way, I, I was in the U.S. Army. I have an honorable discharge, and I honor uh, all the men and women who serve in our armed forces. I honor them, you know, greatly. But I do not honor the policies and some of the, the crapola that they've put us into. I mean, here we are on the 10th year anniversary of the invasion of Iraq. All right, we devastated that country and ripped it apart, and uh, now we're getting ready to pull out. And uh, we've lost what three thousand, five thousand people, a hundred, hundred fifty thousand maimed and post-traumatic stress syndrome and everything else. Uh, what have we got to show for all that? Nothing to speak of. Very, <laughs> when, very true. This is very true. You know, so so, uh, and and now we we get back to Obama. What in the world has he done to uh, to get a Nobel Peace Prize? What has he done? He's waged more war, more aggressive war, more preemptive war than George W. Bush. Why don't we give Bush a a Nobel Peace Prize? Oh, I has. If people aren't thinking, man, they just don't understand. Uh, I fully and, agree with that, right? And there. then people here we have uh, we have the spectacle of uh, Senator Rand Paul 
trying to uh, mount a filibuster to block the confirmation of Brennan as the head of the CIA uh, because he can't get the head of the CIA to pledge that he will not kill Americans on American soil with drones or anything else. Uh, who would have ever thought that was even an issue? Of, you know, without a trial, without lawyer, without anything. I mean, that is so un-American that it's tre- it's tre- treasonous. Hey, amen. I, I think it is. I personally, now I think our military was set up in order to step in when it's needed, and it hasn't stepped in. No, but you know why? Because they they've got a real public relations problem. Um, um, I know, and you probably know too, that uh, there are ranking people in the military who realize this country is bearing way off course, but they also are not stupid or they wouldn't get to that rank. They also know that our military has been uh, cold in recent years of anyone who wants to follow the Constitution and who's willing to stand up against uh, illegal orders. Uh, there was, the, remember the Admiral who said, no, I'm not going to send another fleet to the Persian Gulf. He said, we got two there already. We don't need any more. He said, I'm just not going to do that on my watch. Well, he didn't last but a few more months. And he yeah, was out. Yes, sir. He, they, they did, didn't they? Yep. And you might also recall the helicopter crash killed four or five generals and one uh, fell swoop. Uh, they are getting rid of the ones who will not follow New World Order orders, uh, which is uh, pretty frightening in itself. And of course, I, I don't have to get into the 27,000 armored vehicles and the 1.6 billion uh, rounds of illegal 40 caliber ammunition and the FEMA camps and all like that. I'm sure you guys ta- talk about that all the time. We have, yes, sir. And so, uh, you know, so, so, so where are we? And, 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 but see, they, I know they, the idea was there of maybe stepping in and, and arresting Obama for treason and for uh, violating the Constitution of the United States. There's really no question that this was done, um, both under the NDAA and the National uh, Defense Authorization Act and also under his National Resources uh, Executive Order, where he's placed all water resources in the United States. That's your water, your roof runoff, your rain barrels, uh, the water under the ground, if you've got a well, it's that water, the city water, all water. All water resources are now under the control of the Secretary of Defense, according to Barack Obama. Right. You know, so they, I'm sure they have thought about trying to step in and uh, arrest him, but you see what happens is there's five multinational corporations that control everything we see and hear. Uh, And I'm not talking about just the news, I'm talking about billboards, music, satellite, networks, radio, you name it, okay? Uh, And if they tried to do that, they could easily be styled as a military coup military takeover, and uh, probably the bulk of the people, and perhaps rightly so, would uh, be against that. They'd see that as a a big bad thing, and so they've uh, got a big PR problem there of how to convince the people that they are trying to act in their benefit uh, and are trying to support the Constitution Bill of Rights, which seems to be you know, that's that's uh, no longer in vogue. Uh, all you have to do is read some of these uh, Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, Fusion Center propaganda that's going out to our police departments, and they say if people, uh, if they start talking up the Constitution, then they're probably a potential uh, terrorist. Yeah, that that doesn't make no sense to me. I, yeah, how have we gotten to that? How <laughs> no, have we gotten to you, that? You and me are in the same age bracket, and it was totally different when we were kids. To be a patriot really meant to be an American. That's right. Exactly and now, right. Now it's it ain't. No. Now you're now you're suspect. 
If you try to pay in cash, if you try to save money, <laughs> if you try to give and live a, a, a good ethical life, then there must be something un-American about you. Uh, that just shows uh, how powerful the propaganda from these uh, international corporations actually is. Uh, and, in fact, it comes right on down. Yeah, you and I probably grew up in the, in the old republic. Uh, you remember in school, at least my school, high school, say, we had some characters that were kind of self-reliant and, uh, you know, kind of marched to a different drummer. And uh, in my high school, they were kind of looked up to. as like, you know, they were independent-minded, self-reliant, you know, Marlboro men type, you know. Right. Hero types, and now it's uh, well, they're not going along with the program. There must be something wrong with them, you know. Uh, well, see, at, at one point in our history, it was a good thing to be different and to yes. be re re self reliant, to uh, yes. express your feelings. And today it's looked on as being wrong, they put you through the school like a factory almost. That's right. Well, there's a purpose of that. They are trying to, this is what this Agenda 21 is all about. Uh, the, and, of course, no, no dictator in history has ever tried to seize power and, by telling the people, I want to be dictator and, and kill who I want to kill and lord it over you and, and tax you for all your money. That, who's going to allow that? <laughs> Nobody. No, it's always to, to save the country. Or better yet, to save the children. They've always got some good excuse, you know. But the whole purpose of the, of, uh, the dumbing down of the school system and uh, the uh, Agenda 21 trying to save the environment, the upshot of it is they are trying to get everybody moved into huge urban centers so they can keep control of them and make them totally dependent on central government right and see that's another thing people and since they dumbed down the education system and boy is it dumbed down let me tell you how bad it is my wife recently retired after a lifetime of teaching high school and she's got a friend who just resigned as a teacher of english literature because she got so incensed at the new c-scope plan that the feds are, are pushing and making money off of selling this curriculum to uh, the various school districts, because under the C scope curriculum, uh, her uh, job of teaching English literature suddenly did not require that the kids read even one book. <laughs> now, do what? You yeah, can you picture that? Uh, a course in English literature, and you're not required to read anything, or not a book anyway. You just read little bits and pieces and, and uh, somebody's analysis. That, does, okay. does that make any sense? When we, I don't know about you, but when I was a young kid, uh, we, we were reading Ivanhoe, Tale of Two Cities, you know, yeah. Lord Jim, uh, Rudyard Kipling, uh, you know, uh, oh. About Classic. five or six books a year. Yeah, Jane Eyre and Emily Bronte. I hated her, but I read her. Okay, so... If you wanted uh, to grade, you had to read it. <laughs> exa yeah, exactly. And and the thing is, at the time, I thought, oh, yuck, but uh, Wuthering Heights, come on, give me a break, or <laughs> Silas Mourner. But looking back... I'm glad I was forced to read those books because it gave me a broader worldview and uh, also a classical education in that I knew uh, uh, about a lot of different things. And see, the young folks today, they're not getting this because they don't have to read anything. In fact, <laughs> the other story is she contacted the art teacher at her, her school and said, uh, you know, I'm retired, but I'm still willing to help you put up the senior art exhibit. Every year, the senior art students would take their best work, and they'd put it up in the library, right, for all the kids to see. And, uh, kind of a neat thing for them to get to exhibit their artwork. 
And she was told, no, they're, they're not going to have a senior art exhibit this year. First time probably ever. And why not? You know, because it turns out they've taken all the books out of the school library and they've turned it into an Internet cafe where you can go and look at your computer. And, of course, I think the idea is the kids are supposed to go in there and get on the computer and, and go look up stuff on uh, Wikipedia or somewhere. But, you know, good and well, they're not doing that. They're tweeting and tweeting and, and surfing and, and facing or whatever, you know, and going, going to look at my face <laughs> and all that, all that social networking. That's what they're doing. And, and so it's actually creating a huge uh, dichotomy here because, on the one hand, the younger generations of today with access to the Internet – they have the opportunity to to access more information than probably any other humans in the written history of this world. And yet, <laughs> at the same time, they're the dumbest because they're not doing that. They're they're twittering and tweeting and and going to Facebook and blah blah blah. You know, I'm... they're not taking advantage of the educational possibilities. And so more access to information than ever before, and yet <laughs> they're among the dumbest of the generations. Right. Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. On your website, you had an amazing story about a young man that uh, did some uh, research on the Internet and had uh, done something. Do you know the story I'm talking about? Um, well, you're going to have to give me a little more detail. Uh, he, he, through research on the internet, he had invented a way to detect cancer. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I mentioned that actually. That yeah, that was that one. And then in my new book, Occulted uh, History, um, I really believe I told about uh, uh, there was a high school girl who came up with uh, a cure for certain types of cancers. Oh. Um, and that that was actually uh, broadcast over one of the major networks. Uh, uh, CBS or NBC, and I, I remember that one because I wrote about it and I put it in my book because I want. I know I sent that clipping around to uh, a lot of a lot of my friends and said, "Here, print this out and hang on to it." I said because you're never going to see this story again, right? You know, and this gets back to suppressed technology. But I mean, if a high school kid can figure it out here for cancer. Well, where's all these millions and millions of dollars that the American Cancer Society is, is gouging out of us each year? Right. You can't seem to do anything. And that's because, quite simply, there's more people making a living off of cancer than dying from it. Uh, that That's definitely dying. Dying is a big business. Uh, I want to let everybody know that you you have your website is jimmars dot com and that's Mars with two R's. Mm -hmm. And all your books are available there. Yep. I mean, we even have a advertisement that goes across our uh, chat room where uh, you can uh, get to his site from there. I'm pretty sure I've got you uh, down there on link on my website too. If I don't, I certainly uh, will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now your web, your uh, Facebook page is too full to accept anybody else. I've noticed. <laughs> I know, isn't that something? And, <laughs> well, and that's then, a good then, thing. That's well, a good I guess thing. it's a good thing, except I get people get mad at me because I'm not answering them back. And I have to explain to them, hey, I'm only one guy. And, <laughs> he, I, and for the last few years, I've been operating under two separate book contracts, trying to get two books out of here. Plus, I got a family, plus I've got a farm to run. I've got, I've got goats and chickens <laughs> and a horse. Oh, you know, I've got That's stuff great. to take care of. And, uh, and, and I, you, you get four and five hundred emails a day and plus Facebook just loaded up. I mean, as you said, they won't even let me have any more friends. And I mean, I, I just can't do it. You know, what can I say? Uh, well, you're doing great. I know that. Uh, and, uh, you've, you've made a lot of difference in people's lives. I, I know that for a fact. I, I talk to a lot of people, uh, uh, over the internet, and you're one of the names that pops up quite a bit. 
Well, uh, my background is as a reporter and as a journalist, and I do have a college degree in journalism. And and like I said earlier, I I have just pledged myself to try to find out truth and tell it to people. And and so as a result, I don't have any agendas. I'm not trying to push left or right or conservative or liberal or Democrat, Republican, any. I'm not trying to push anything. I'm just trying to tell people what I have found out and let them make up their own mind about uh, how, what they want to do with that information. And so I, I'm pretty gratified that, uh, you know, about the worst that people say about me is, I don't believe that. <laughs> well, okay, that's <laughs> fine. You, you can believe anything you want to believe, yeah. right? <laughs> but I, that's the same always- thing. Welcome back, folks. This is a mad painter, a.k.a. Thomas Becker, and uh, y'all just don't know how good you, lucky you are to hit get to hear that over the air and not through Skype. It sure sounds terrible in Skype. We're we're sitting here with Jim Mars and we're talking and he has enlightened me about a few things tonight. And uh he promised me an hour and uh he said if he felt up to it he'd stick around and I I'm glad you stuck around for the hour and if if you need to go, I, I understand. Well, I can stick around a little bit because I have a question for you. Sure. You're the mad painter. Uh, do you do you paint like paintings or do you paint walls? <laughs> well, my my occupation is I'm a painter. I paint houses, but oh, I okay. I am an artist. Well, there you go. Somebody told me you paint men and women. Men on one well, door and women on the other door. <laughs> That's the easiest, and I use a stencil. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Don't get too artistic about it. Right? <laughs> now, I do most of my art on the computer now. Uh, when oh, this is cool. up on uh, YouTube, most of the stuff that flashes well, the interviews going out is my work. So. Well, that's really great, and I'll tell you, that's where I think somebody can really shine, because if uh, any, any young person out there trying to figure out what you want to do, if you have some artistic ability, uh, then learn the computer, uh, because uh, there's a lot of people that are very artistic, but they don't really know how to apply that to the computer, and then likewise, there's a lot of people who are great computer programmers, but they're just not that, they're not an artist, you know, they're not cr- that creative. And so, man, if you can blend those two and be a creative artist on the computer, I think you you probably got a pretty pretty good profession ahead of you. Well, I've brought a whole new meaning to the word starving artist. So. <laughs> they think they just got to go sit in that cubicle and work for somebody to make a living to be successful, but. Hey, it's, it's success is it's not how you measure it. If, if you're doing something that you feel like is worthwhile and that you enjoy doing, then that's it, baby. Do it. Just right. do that. And and things will work out, you know. That's it's kind of like, kind of like me. I've, I'd always heard of rich and famous, but nobody ever told me about just famous. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, see... Now I I do my job because I enjoy it. Like you said, if you, if that's how you, I measure my success. As well you should. And so I mean I don't have to work a physical job, but you, you don't have to have your farm, right? No, no. See, but... see, see, and I know I from talking with you, I know that's how you relax. Oh yeah. You know, I, I just feel that from you, that your farm is, is your pride and joy. But you know what? It also makes you schizophrenic because uh, <laughs> I know uh, not so much now, but uh, years ago when I was really hustling around and not only writing, but I was also working advertising, public relations. I'd go into Dallas and Fort Worth, and I'd wear that suit, and I'd sit in those boardrooms and those agency offices, you know, at the conference room, and wearing my suit and tie, and we're talking about how to maximize profits and how to uh, market all of these unnecessary products. And then I come home and put on my blue jeans and go sit out on the bluff and watch the hawk circle overhead and smell the fresh air, and, and it's like, hey, wait a minute, which one of these are the real world? 
And, of course, I don't think I have to tell you, the real world is the natural world. Right. Uh, I'm not a farmer myself. I, I know very little about uh, tending animals and growing. I grew up pretty much on the edge of the city. Right now I live kind of in the country, but I don't own land where I could you know, farm or anything like that. I'd love to learn. That's one of the reasons I hang around the station because they drop all kinds of bits of information about that kind of life. And when uh, we have a government like we got, they want us to be dependent on the government, and where we we're going wrong is we need to be dependent on ourselves. Exactly. The more they try to push me into being dependent on them, the more independent I want to be. Uh, I tell people I raise registered quarter chickens. <laughs> do do what? <laughs> I raise registered quarter chickens. You know what a quarter chicken is? It's no, just sir. Quarter- just 25 cents. <laughs> just, just <cheap> chicken. <laughs> I knew something was coming up. I was already <laughs> laughing and coughing. <laughs> but, you know, there's actually a story there. I told that joke uh, to a reporter for the New York Times some time ago. They call, He called me up, and he was asking me some stuff, I think, about the Kennedy assassination. And then he got through, and he said, well, okay, what city do you live in? I said, well, I don't live in a city. He said, well, what town do you live in? I said, well, I don't live in a town. I said, I'm in an unincorporated rural area here in North Texas. And uh, I said, I raised registered quarter chickens, and he fell for it. He said, what's a quarter chicken? I said, 25 cents. And I was just joking with him. Well, uh, a few write- weeks later, I'm getting these clippings out of the New York Times, uh, and it says, they have, uh, we'll give him this. He quoted me correctly. And he said, said, Jim Mars, a chicken farmer in North Texas. So <laughs> the problem is, is that in, uh, in the future, somebody's going to quote me and somebody else is going to say, well, don't listen to him. He's just a chicken farmer <laughs> in, in North Texas. And the other guy said, no, 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 he wasn't. And said, yeah, he was. It's right here in the New York Times. That sounds like another conspiracy. <laughs> Well, it's how it's how things in the news media, if they if they get something wrong, as they too often do, it stays there. I mean, it's just there. And then the next reporter coming along trying to report, he'll go back and read that story and get it wrong, <laughs> you know, and repeat the the error. Uh, that that is a lot of problem. Uh, people don't do their own research. No. You know, I mean, you do have. Ninety percent of the information we have is secondhand information, you know. Right. And so it gets hard to do it right. So so sometimes you do end up being wrong. Well, at least I end up being wrong. (laughs) Oh, I've been wrong plenty of times, but I pride myself on if I'm wrong, somebody show me the error of my ways. I will back off and say, "Gee, I was wrong." Here's what it is. All you got to do is just show me what's right. Uh, for the break, you know, it's just, uh, this whole thing about, well, I don't believe that, uh, that's not a valid argument. <laughs> you believe anything you want to believe, uh, but information, facts, and evidence is something else. Again, uh, if I say two and two is five, and you say no, or contraire, two and two is four, and here's why, and you run me through the math, uh, I like to think that I'd say uh, big enough to say, well, I, you know, you're wrong. I mean, I was wrong. You know, right. it, it, two plus two is four. Uh, and, I, and I've and i done that uh, because we, we're all uh, liable to get bad information. Uh, the difference is when you find out it's bad information, admit to it and correct it, right? Yes, yeah, sir. I, I agree with that now. Uh a lot, a lot of the information I get, like I said, it's secondhand information, and you have to stand on the, the uh, qualifications of the, the place you got it from. You know exactly. You got to consider the source. That's what I try to tell people all the time, especially now with the internet, because with the internet, uh, you know, the the upside of the internet is that everybody and anybody has access to the internet, but. They don't stop and think the downside is that everybody and anybody has got access to the Internet. So you have to be careful and you have to be discerning. And that's not a very easy thing it's, uh, because 
there's a lot of people out there who are either honestly mistaken or maliciously mistaken or just out and out con guys, you know. And so you, you just have to be very careful. So one of the things you have to do is when you read something on the Internet and you go, holy cow, then you have to stop and ask yourself, wait a minute, where did this come from? And you got to <laughs> track it back, you know. And, for example, if you see a story that says, uh, you know, so-and-so, Dr. So-and-so says uh, that nuclear power is perfectly safe. Well, you go, oh, wow. He says, well, wait a minute, now who's this guy? And you go and you check and you find out that he's uh, president of the Atomic Industrial Forum. Well, that's an industry, uh, you know, group of uh, nuclear power plant people. What do you expect them to say? Of course they're going to say that. <laughs> so you have to kind of, you know, you have to just consider the source on a lot of this stuff. And like I say, unfortunately, um, what really bothers me, and it's still going on, is that if you go down to your local newspaper and say, hey, guess what I found out, and you give them a huge blockbuster story, they're not just going to run with it. They're going to say, well, how do you know that? Can you prove that? Have you got three sources? Uh, is there somebody else to verify that? You got any photographs? How about videos? You know, you got a tape recording of that? I mean, they're going to run you through the third degree as well, probably, as they should. The problem is the government sends them a pronouncement and they run it on the front page and they never even check to see if it's true. Yeah, I've, I've seen that happen in, in the media. Uh, we've all seen it on TV, too, several times quite recently. <laughs> oh, you see you see it all the time. Right now, they're, they're jimmying with the uh, unemployment figures, uh, trying to make it look like, well, things are getting better and things are looking good. And, oh, well, you know, we, we had uh, uh, so much increase last month, you know. And uh, most of these most of these numbers and statistics are just bogus as can be. Uh, for example, in the unemployment figures, you know they carry you for it used to be nine months. They may have extended it some now, and then after that, if you still ain't got a job, they they drop you. Okay, so all of a sudden you're off the unemployment rolls. You still ain't got a job, but you're off the rolls, so you you don't count anymore. They don't count those people. <laughs> yeah, that don't them. that don't make much sense, does it? Uh uh-uh, uh uh uh. But you know, it's like uh, it's like the old joke said. Seventy nine point three percent of all statistics are just made up off the top of their head, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, one thing about the 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 unemployment that. Uh, fascinates me is, is the way it's set up if you get a job you get it canceled immediately but most jobs are wait two weeks to pay you right or actually it's a month before you get your first one you know yeah and what are you supposed to do between now and then yeah it just doesn't make much sense uh-uh. well it none of it does no none, none of it does at all uh you know when uh the the uh for instance, the war on terrorism, if if that was real and if we truly had to be so concerned about a well-financed evil group of sinister Mid-Eastern uh, terrorists who were wanting to slip weapons of mass destruction into our country, you'd think that the first common sense thing you'd do is secure the border. Right. But, but they hadn't even done that, have they? No. Uh-uh. Well, one <laughs> uh, thing I noticed that really, uh, I, I don't, for lack of a better word, freaks me out is we have one of the most secure borders to the north with Canada. That it's, I mean, it's out real, unreal how sophisticated it is, and we got a fence in Mexico, but nobody <laughs> from Canada is trying to get in here. Well, I know, <laughs> I know, and, and let me tell you about the fence. Uh, my daughter recently got married, and my new son-in-law is from Del Rio, which is right down there on the border of Mexico, mm-hmm. a very, very south end of Texas. 
So we'd been down there several times. And so I was driving around to Del Rio and got down along by the border there. And here is about a 12-foot high metal fence with a curved top with pointed spike, a curvy, spiky fence with no cross pieces. So you can't get a foothold, you know, to try to get over it. And I was just looking at this thing, and I looked off to my right, and that thing stretched as far as I could see. And I'm going, wow, what a security fence. And then I turn and look to my left, and it just stopped. <laughs> there was nothing there. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just, and this wasn't even at a border checkpoint. This was just in a residential area there in Del Rio. And I'm thinking, well, you know, if I was a Mexican and I wanted to come over the United States, I'd just walk to the end of the fence and walk around it. <laughs> It just doesn't make no sense. It to makes no sense whatsoever. There's, uh, what, what's yeah, that? Uh, common sense ain't so common anymore? That's true. That is very true. In fact, it seems to be passe now. You know, nobody, nobody really wants to deal with somebody with common sense. <laughs> I deal with that all the time because I don't like to carry around a pocket full of change. So, you know, when, when I'm in a store or a restaurant or whatever and Say that say the bill's uh, uh, six dollars and fifty cents, right? So I give them a ten dollar bill, a dollar bill, and two quarters. Okay, this way I get a five dollar bill back, right? Right. They don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> they they look like I hit them over the head with a stick. They don't they know how to one, make change. Especially if they got one of the machines that drops the change down. Yeah. That really yeah. messes them up. <laughs> <laughs> really messes them up, and uh, and the and the, I guess the real irony of that is is that one of the main reasons I got into journalism is because I was terrible in math and I hated math. And I I got to the university. I said, well, "What degree course can I take that doesn't require any math?" And they said, "Well, there's journalism." I said, "Okay, sign me up." <laughs> so I'm terrible in math, but at least I can make change. <laughs> without a computer. Oh, man. The world has changed a lot since we were kids, haven't it? Oh, boy, it has. You know, I was just thinking there, I grew up on the south side of Fort Worth, Texas, uh, right near TCU, uh, Texas Christian University there. And when I was in kindergarten, what what age what age are you when you're in kindergarten? About six? Yeah, five or six. Like five yeah. or six. I would walk up the block from my house and uh, meet my neighbor kid, John, who's who's now retired Texas appeals court judge. <laughs> Holy cow, too much time has gone by. <laughs> and and then go pick up a, a little girl that's a friend of ours, and we would walk by ourselves for several blocks and then cross the TCU campus uh, to get to the elementary school that we attended. And we just walked there, three little kids, about five or six years old, just on our own, you know, walking on up there. And we, in the afternoon, we walked back. You know, it, it wasn't any big deal. It was, uh, and there wasn't anything to be afraid of. Right. Well, so I, now, I didn't have to lock where I live now. I live in the south of Georgia. And we just now having to start locking our doors. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I've, now... I know I sound like I'm from the South, but I was born in New York. I just live in the South and have for years. Uh, I was going to say, you, you, had, you, can't, you can't have been too recent uh, an arrival no, I, because I, you talk like a Southerner. I've been right here where I'm at for uh, almost 33 years or almost there 34 you years. So. Well, you've been naturalized. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm one of them damn Yankees. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that was hey, my, uh, that. my grandmother, uh, her father, and this is this shows how that we're not that far uh, removed from our from history. My my grandmother, who lived to be 102, and who I still vividly remember, and, and I loved her a lot. Her, she can she would tell me stories about her father coming home from the Civil War, and he was a doctor on uh, Stonewall Jackson's staff or, or with his army. Uh, and uh, I swear, I think I was, I was, I was, I think I was a grown man 
before I realized that uh, damn Yankee was two words. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought it was just one word. I like that. That is cute. I got to remember that now. <laughs> this has been a great conversation. I, I'm enjoying myself. By well, the way, good. So I can't That's, tell. Uh, Hey, as long as we're stuck here on this uh, physical, material plane, uh, the least we do is try to have a good time. Well, I myself don't believe in all that worry about doom and gloom and you know, stuff you can't control. I mean, there are stuff here that we have to worry about that, that we need to uh, control, like our money system and yeah. what's going on in politics. I believe that's something we all need to step up and take a look at, you know. Well, how, what do you think about this? See, politics is one thing, and since I decided to be a journalist, I have kind of eschewed politics. I, I, I would not join the young Republicans or the young Democrats in college, and I had not joined a political party because I didn't want somebody to say, well, you only wrote that story because you're a Democrat or because you're a Republican. So I have tried to uh, remain as objective as possible not even get involved in politics, but I gotta say this. Politics is one thing, and just in and of itself, it basically only means the normal interaction uh, and conflict between people as they try to figure out how to um, uh, do things in life, okay? In other words, if you and I agree that uh, we need a new road, and so we agree on that, but then we fall out and we fight over how are we going to pay for this new road? That's politics, and that's not necessarily good or evil. It's just that's just the way the world works. Think, things have to work that way. Exactly. Just, I, but, I don't believe in any party myself. Yeah, but my thing, Thomas, is this. Today, some of the things that's happening, particularly at the federal level, Again, we mention it, and you mention it all the time on your shows, the uh, NDAA, uh, the buying up of uh, outlawed ammunition for Homeland Security, the FEMA camps, the chemtrails. Uh, that's beyond politics. That's not politics. And yet I hear people all the time, oh, don't get political. Don't get into that. We don't want to talk politics. Folks, that's not politics. That's anti-constitutional, illegal criminal activity and that we ought to be able to discuss yes sir <laughs> oh I fully, Am I, right? agree. I fully agree with that now personally they i'm not afraid of people on the other side of the world that want the same thing for their families as i do it's the governments of the world that are trying to control things that we have to watch out for That's and, absolutely and it's our responsibility to make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing that's uh, right i i blame our gen well my my generation several down, generations let's face yeah, it several down, generations have not been paying attention that's right i i tell you we had a dollar for every time i've heard somebody say over the years well let washington take care of that well <laughs> folks they have <laughs> and it's not a pretty picture so we have got to reclaim the sovereignty that we once have uh, and start making decisions that are in the benefit of the country itself. Uh, for example, one thing that always happens is, well, for the last two, three, four elections, national elections, I've been on radio, I've been on TV, I've been wherever I am, and I've been trying to tell people, vote Congress out. Vote every one of those people out, okay? Because unless you really like what's going on right now, because everybody up there has been there when all these laws and all these policies have been put into place. So if you really like what's going on, well, you keep sending those jerks back. But if you have, if you are as concerned as I am and so many other people are about the direction this country's going, then we got to send a message. And that message is you're not going to last up there unless you do things into the benefit of the country and of the people. So when you have a chance, vote them all out. But it never happens. In fact, this last election is upset. And even following with the, uh, uh, the debacle 
of the finances since 2008, uh, most of them were all returned to office, okay? And what happens is, is that I travel around the country, is that everybody, well, uh, uh, you, for example, uh, Thomas, you, you say, yeah, I'm with you. We need to vote out all those congressmen, you know? But 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 not ours. Uh, he's a crook, but he's our crook, and we got a new fire engine, you know. So I'm gonna put him back in there because we need him. Well, everybody says that, and the same old crooks get back in there, and nothing changes. We need to clean the house. We need to just vote them all out and start all over again, and watch them like a hawk. And then uh, when the next election comes. If they voted the way you think they should have voted, then you vote for them again. If not, you vote them out. And you know what? Actually, if you stop and think about it, that's not a radical idea. That's the way it's supposed to work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's what gets me. <laughs> now, uh, what do you think of them uh, a while back there? W with all the problems that we're having it, with uh, the recession and uh I don't know what else to call it. Uh, personally, I think we're in a, a dep depression. Oh, but, we're in a uh, worse depression than the 30s. They're just not calling it that. Right. <laughs> and they turn around and vote themselves a $3,000 a month increase in pay. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Plus, you know, it's just like uh, it's just like the, the generals and the politicians and everybody that was in office on September the 11th, 2001. Here we lost two of our prized assets, you know, there in New York, plus plus damaging the Pentagon, plus killed 3,000 people. Uh, okay, now, if you were working for a corporation and you lost some of their biggest assets, got somebody killed, uh, what's going to happen? You're going to get at least called on the carpet, probably get fired, right? <laughs> but <laughs> no, likely, nobody yeah. got fired. Nobody even got demoted. Nobody even got called on the carpet. And by the way, while I'm on 9-11, let me just simply point out uh, what the senior counsel of the 9-11 uh, the 9-11 commission, what he has said publicly. Um, he says... Now, pay attention. This is not some conspiracy theorist. This was John Farmer, senior counsel to the official uh, George W. Bush-appointed 9-11 Commission. And he said in 2009, in the course of our investigation into the national response to the attacks, the 9-11 Commission staff discovered that the official version of what had occurred that morning um, was almost entirely and inexplicably untrue. Huh? He, he, so, so they gave us this cock and bull story of these nineteen Muslim hijackers, and they and they had they you know commandeered four planes, and two of them crashed into the two. World Trade Center towers, and one of them crashed in the Pentagon, and one of them crashed into the ground in Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, yet uh, nobody's really explained how that Building 7, the Solomon's Brothers building, how it collapsed that afternoon. Oh. It didn't get hit by an airplane. Look. And how did the 9-11 Commission explain that? Look, it look. didn't. It just didn't even mention it. Really? How's look. that for an investigation? Let's think about that while we take a quick break, okay? Welcome back, folks. I hope you're enjoying this as much as I've been enjoying this. Uh, I, I feel that uh, uh, Jim Mars is a kindred spirit. He, he, he has a, a very level head at looking at stuff, and I'm really enjoying it. And just before break, we were talking about 9-11 a little bit. And uh, I, I got a question for you. Jim, that uh, kind of bugs me. You being a researcher, and I know you've looked into the 9-11 case uh, quite a bit. Uh, you were on a show here at the station uh, about a year ago with uh, 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 somebody who had a show here named Terrell 03. And uh, yeah. I, I, I had interviewed 
Scott Walter. Do you know who he is? Mm, I think so. He'd done the analysis on the Pentagon after 9-11, and, and he claims that it was a plane that hit the Pentagon. What is your conclusion on that? I, I don't believe it was a plane. I don't believe myself. it. I just don't believe it, okay? and But here's the thing. That could be cleared up so easily. Uh, if a plane hit the Pentagon... Well, now, folks, follow me here. I'm not telling you this isn't rocket scientists. I'm just using my common sense. In every major plane crash in the past, they always gather up every little piece of that aircraft that they can find, and they go and they take and they reassemble it in a big hangar somewhere so they can figure out exactly what happened so they can make sure it doesn't happen again, right? And we've all seen pictures of the debris. Okay, fine. Show me pictures of the debris, and, and I'll, I'll shut up about the Pentagon. But there hasn't been any. There wasn't any there at the time. Everybody remembers seeing the big, huge, gaping gash in the uh, west wall of the Pentagon. But what most people either have forgotten or never knew is that the wall didn't immediately get a hole in it. The wall was intact for, uh, I don't know, half hour or more. Uh, and then finally, portion of the wall collapsed. Well, I have photographs before the wall collapsed, and you've got a little bitty hole, no, no taller than 20 feet, uh, no taller than 12 feet, because it's right at ground level, and it only goes up to the first floor, and you can see windows in the second and third floor, and they're still intact. And it's only about 20 feet wide and about 12 foot tall. Uh, a 747 has a wingspan of 125 feet and a tail height of, of 44 feet, which is like four stories. How do you get a four-story tall aircraft with a wingspan of 125 feet into a hole that's only 20 foot wide and 12 foot hot tall. You can't. <laughs> you can't and do I, it. plus, plus, <clears throat> hey, keep in mind too that I've won awards as an aviation, aerospace, and military writer. So I know these things. I, in fact, I, I was, uh, if, if I hadn't of, uh, I'm a flight school dropout, but I almost had my pilot's license. And like I said, I've been an aviation rider, and I've been in all kinds of aircraft. And believe me, uh, with this steel-reinforced concrete wall, if the 747 had hit with those two giant 12,000-pound titanium steel jet engines on either side, uh, one of two things would have happened. The most likely thing, since uh, weight is so critical to an aircraft, uh, and that uh, these flying commercial liners are basically like flying beer cans. They're just, uh, you know, they're a frame covered with uh, uh, aluminum or with uh, trying to keep the weight down. Those two jet engines would have hit that wall, would have ripped off, and would have been lying there in front of the Pentagon. But we didn't see that. So, therefore, the only other possible explanation would be that it did because of inertia and because of the uh, thrust, that it pushed its way through the wall, which means there should have been two big giant holes there where those engines went through. But that wasn't there either. Now, I'm sorry, I don't know about uh, some of the people who say, oh, there's an airplane. For one thing, I think some of the witnesses did see a uh, commercial-type airline coming in low over the Pentagon. Uh, the uh, the uh, website uh, pilots for 9/11 Truth uh, said that there there was a large aircraft. It did go, but then by their reckoning and by the flight recorder, and by based on the witnesses and based on everything they were able to determine, it never got lower than 300 feet, which means it passed over the Pentagon. So I think what happened there was that you did have a large commercial airliner-type plane that flew in, flew down through that basin, or pretty low through that basin where the Pentagon sat, and then probably hooked a sharp-degree turn and went up the Potomac out over the ocean. And at the same time, something 
uh, flew in and struck the base of the uh, of the Pentagon, but the explosions, by the way, took place inside. Okay, and uh, you need to read my book, The Terror Conspiracy Revisited, and in the back is a appendix by Barbara Honiger, a Pentagon uh, writer, military writer, and she shows that the clocks. Uh, that were stopped by the explosion uh, show that the, the explosions happened before uh, they say anything hit the building. So there's something very, very unusual, very strange, very sinister about what's going on there. Now the question would be, well, wh- wh- why would they want to blow up something in the Pentagon? Well, very simply, because the day before 9-11, Donald Rumsfeld was forced to announce that the Pentagon could not account for $2.3 trillion, which was far more than even that year's total military budget. What happened to it? We don't know. Who would have been in charge of finding out what happened to all that? The uh, the uh, Pentagon's accounting office. Who suffered the most casualties on 9-11? The Army's accounting office. In fact, I think all of them got killed but one guy because he happened to be out of the office at the time. And, and ever since then, ever since 9-11, there's never been any more mention about the missing $2.3 trillion. Do you, do you think this, that just the, that they uh, might have just used the opportunity of the other happenings of that day to cover that fact then, right? Uh, if that's all there was to it, I would say that's yeah. a pretty good theory. But there's too much going on. Yeah, why were there I all of these? That. Why were all these war game exercises taking place on that morning? And then they lied about that and covered up for a year, saying, "Oh no, that's an internet rumor." And now it's fully documented that it happened. Uh, why did they allow the Bin Laden family to cry to? fly across country and gather in Boston and leave the country uh, without being questioned by the FBI during the time that there was a no-fly zone. No, but you and I couldn't fly, but the Bin Ladens could. Why were the Bin Ladens the good close friends of the Bushes? In fact, George W. Bush got his start in the oil business with uh, money from Salim Bin Laden, Osama Bin Laden's older brother. How come we hadn't been told about that? No, there's too much more to it, and uh, for me to believe that it was simply a case of some bad terrorist act that they were taking advantage of. No, no, no. This was a, a, a classic false flag operation. And just in case anybody hadn't, doesn't know what a false flag operation is, that goes back to the days of the sailing ships and the uh, naval battles, and when you were up on an enemy ship, one of the one of the favorite tactics was, say you're a English ship and you're approaching a French uh, frigate. Okay, well you'd run up the French flag, and as you approached, because think about it, old sailing ships, you see them coming for hours. Okay, and as they approach, they see the French flag flying, so they don't go to general quarters don't man their cannons, you know, they think it's a friendly ship coming. And then at the last minute, when they get up side by side, you run down the French flag, you run up the Union Jack, and you say, actually, we're British, and you let them have a broadside. (laughs) That is a false flag attack, because you're using a false flag, and you're uh, acting like you're somebody that you're not. Well, this is what happened on 9-11. 9-11. We I, were told I think you just these... filled in a big hole for a lot of people out there that didn't understand what false flag meant, too. Well, good. That's, the, that's where it came from, and that's what it means. And when they say a false flag of attack, that simply means that whoever actually committed the act uh, made it look like it was somebody else. <laughs> and they, they, of course, have told us that it was... Uh, uh, those 19 Muslim hijackers, although none of those people's names were on any of the airline manifest, none of them were listed as passengers. We've got we've got some vague photos uh, taken with security cameras of Muhammad Atta at an airport, but there's no pictures of him actually getting on an airplane, you know. And and of course they all say, well, they disintegrated 
and blew up and destroyed everything. Well, how convenient is that? And speaking of, back to the Pentagon, uh, how do we know uh, who was on that plane? Well, they claim that, uh, first off, they don't have any wreckage because it all buried into the building and then exploded in such a fiery explosion that it melted the whole plane, seats, chairs, you know, landing gear, engines, titanium steel blades, the whole thing. It all just melted down. And yet a few weeks later, the FBI said, well, we identified the victims by their fingerprints. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, I know. Folks, I use, can't, your head, use your head. I <laughs> couldn't it's believe it the, when they said that. No. <laughs> yeah, you have to steal your plane I, melt. I, I How are you going to get fingerprints? I hate to laugh, but the way you put it, it you know. It, well, it's it, that it's, silly. Yeah, I but, know. But, 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 they've got, but they've got hired media people who come on network television, CNN, and tell you this stuff with a straight face and just think how many of us believed it. Oh, I think some of the media <laughs> people believed it, too. Oh, they believe it because they, well, they, they better believe it or they're not going to get any more handouts from the, <laughs> from the Pentagon. You know, uh, this, it's just, it's, it's, incre it's incredible. It really this, is. This is great. Uh, everybody, I want to remind you, his website is jimmars.com, and that's Mars with two R's now. Not like the planet Mars. A and uh, you can check out all his books there. He he's got quite a few books there. Uh, let me see. There's uh, Crossfire, which is the JFK uh, assassination. You got Alien Agenda, Rule by Secrecy, Inside Job, The Fourth Reich, The Trillion Dollar Conspiracy, Our Occultic History, and what what is the name? I didn't catch the name of the new book that you just finished putting to press tonight. Well, that that's the one you just mentioned. Our occulted history. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. And, oh, and let me point out. I just got to point out. When I say our occulted history. Uh, it has nothing to do uh, with witches or vampires or devil worship, okay, or anything that we normally think of as the occult. Uh, I use the term occulted in the astronomical sense. Uh, when the moon eclipses the sun, that's called an occultation. Uh, it occults the sun, and that simply means hidden. So basically, our occulted history just means our hidden history. And um, all of my latest books, uh, The Rise of Fourth Ride, Crossfire, uh, Trillion Dollar Conspiracy, um, which that was not my title. <laughs> they made me change it. Uh, my title was Zombie Nation. <laughs> and I think that would have really got some eyebrows going. But all of those have been New York Times bestsellers. Uh, with the exception of Alien Agenda, but I got to mention that because Alien Agenda was written back in '95, '96, um, and uh, it was the result of going around the country and asking people what they thought was the next big secret government cover-up, and almost unanimously, people said, "We want to know the truth about UFOs." Is there really something there? And if so, what are they? And who's flying them? And what do they want? And that led me to uh, journalistically research and write about UFOs. And at that time, though, everybody thought anybody who writes about UFOs must be a nut. So it sold very well. In fact, it's still selling. In fact, I'm told it is now the top selling nonfiction book on UFOs in the world. Wow. It's yeah, it's been translated into about a dozen languages, and it's been it was very well received because it's not it's not just people saying oh he came and got me you know or I saw this it's 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 the whole history of God go all the way back to to the Bible I mean Ezekiel and the fiery wheel flying through the air hello <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think it's gone hand in hand with our true history. Exactly, and that's why I see uh, for people uh, in your audience that are all concerned about the New World Order and about uh, the creeping, and, uh, not creeping, but galloping fascism in this country and what's really going on, uh, if they totally ignore the issue of UFOs and ETs, 
uh, they're never going to figure out what's really going on because they they're throwing out a big piece of the puzzle. Yeah, I fully agree with that. Uh, I, I I believe I believe in UFOs. Uh, well, I believe in aliens. Now, the the universe is too big, and mankind's ego is pretty big to think that we're the only ones around. Now, as far as UFOs, a lot of them could be. I'll say the majority of them are probably government run. I, I would say a bunch of them are, yeah, because we've been back engineering and and trying to figure out alien technology since uh, actually before um, before 1947 and the Roswell incident. In fact, I think if I was hearing correctly on on your little promo thing, those clips that you were running uh, to, to intro the show, I think that they were, there was one of them talking about the the uh, great Los Angeles air raid. Wasn't that part of that? Yeah, it was uh, one of them uses that part to, uh, uh, yeah. for a show. Yeah, and I've, I've got uh, copies of the government documents showing that uh, in the wake of that, uh, the great Los Angeles air raid, that was February of uh, 1942, uh, that they recovered unconventional aircraft in the San Bernardino Mountains and also uh, out at sea. So apparently we did manage to bring something down. Mm-hmm. But uh, in fact, in this same communique that was uh, sent from George Marshall, who was uh, um, the uh, White House uh, uh, assistant there to Roosevelt, uh, at the bottom it said, uh, we are making a search of War Department files uh, looking for any accounts of unconventional aircraft dating back to 1897, which wow. I find of particular interest because that was the very year of the Aurora spaceship crash here in Texas. Wow. And uh, in that instance, which was fully reported in the Dallas and Fort Worth newspapers. They said that on April the uh, 17th, 1897, a silver cigar-shaped object crashed in Aurora, Texas, which is about 20 miles north of Fort Worth, actually about five miles down the road from where I live right now. Wow. And, uh, and that, uh, that third paragraph said the, uh, the pilot of the craft, who's supposed to be the only one on board, said... Uh, was badly disfigured, but enough uh, was picked up to show that he was not an inhabitant of this world. This is 1897. This is six years before the Wright brothers flew. Right. Now, so, you know, there was nothing man-made in the air. That's interesting. Uh, I believe I've I've uh, heard a little bit about that case. Mm-hmm. Uh, we we we've, we've got about three minutes, and uh, is there anything that we've not covered that you'd like to tell our listening audience? Oh, I, I think about the only thing I want to say is that uh, we've covered a whole lot of ground here, and I'm sure a lot of people are shaking their head, going, "Well, we are we are in a mess," but but what are we going to do about it? What am I supposed to do about it? And uh, I I just like to tell people that number one, turn off your TV. All it's doing is programming you, both physically and psychologically. Uh, if you don't believe me, just go Google 4S Technology. That's S-S-S-S Technology. Go and Google that. Find out about that. It's scary as can be, and that's what happens when you stay glued to the TV. So get off that uh, TV, uh, the uh, uh, the the propaganda and the conditioning that's taken place there. Um, and then question the sources of the information. And I guess the key thing is start thinking for yourself, okay? Don't trust me and don't don't believe everything I say, but just listen to me and then go check it out. And when you check it out, if you find out what I'm telling you is true, then it, you don't have to worry about whether you want to believe me or not. You'll know it for yourself. Right. I, s- for yourself. I say that all the time myself, <laughs> <laughs> almost word for word. Thank you for joining us, folks.